guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast. And I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. As you know, I'm always interested in studying the top 0.1% of people, people on the cutting edge in terms of mindset, health, time, emotional, financial freedom, getting their distinction. So today, I'm happy to introduce Eileen Marcus, and she's going to talk to us, for lack of a better term, managing annoying me, getting out of our own way. And um, she's got a lot of interesting ideas. Um, she talks about this idea of cross pollination, and um, and I'm happy to welcome her to the show. Eileen, welcome. Thank you. So happy to be here. Yeah. Very happy. Um, yeah, I'm so happy to have you on the show, and I'm always interested in people on the doing different things and how we can apply it. So tell the audience your backstory, what you do, how you got started, and we'll we'll get into it. Well, my backstory is that I grew up in one of those rough houses that I had to find a solution outside of the home. And for me, that was community and working, right? If I'm a babysitter, someone else is going to feed me and pay me and I get to watch their TV without, you know, my parents fighting in the background or, or ragging on me, you know, and then it became like community groups where you showed up and they were happy to have you and they gave you dinner and, you know, and you got involved and you were part of something. So I was always looking for a way to get out of my house. And that really led me to community. And I became a social worker to help others who had rough, you know, situations. And through that, I really learned that financial freedom is the greatest gift we can give each other. And that's what led me to entrepreneurialism and to helping people show up as their best selves. Because even when people love us, when we are like me, I talk fast, I do a lot, I'm this, I'm that. It's very hard for people to really follow you and hook into you. So, you know, I really got here. Um, I worked in nonprofits, government. I have both, as I said, a social work degree and a master's. But the real thing is I had a boss who went to jail for embezzlement. Oh. Now, for me, yeah, bad work oh. on the cover of like A1 of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you know, the Daily News, the Post. I was in New York at the time. So it was oh. a huge public embarrassment. Uh -huh. And what happened after that was I was collateral damage. I was fired, but I kept on getting jobs and I was making good money. You know, I had a kid in college. I was working, you know, but I realized I wasn't doing what I loved anymore. I was just following the money. And that was the real turnaround to how do I do what I love? How do I become an entrepreneur? And how do I lead this life that I'm responsible? And that led to managing annoying me. I had to get out of my own way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, the yeah, that's quite interesting. See, because you managed ten thousand people under Mayor Giuliani. I, I'm, I'm curious if your bo their boss was the uh, Elliot Spitzer. Was my was my next no, question. Elliot was a state employee. I knew Elliot well. You know, <laughs> it's sad. You know, we like to think about in politics, right? That. Um, you know, if you look at what some people did in the past compared to what's going on now, they should still be in office. They didn't do so bad with personal issues gone awry, you know, a little crazy thinking. But um, but I know Rudy Giuliani was my boss. And, um, you know, there's a lot of debate because he's on the cover of my first book, Managing Annoying People. And a lot of people say, I would never read a book with him on it. Uh -huh. And I say, you know, there was a time he was the mayor of New York. If you know anything about New York City, he turned that city around. People didn't want to come in. You couldn't, you know, be at a stop, a stop sign, uh, um, stoplight without squeegee men and feeling fearful. And I was part of that turnaround. So before Rudy, I managed, you know, a few volunteers, some interns, some policy people. And I was doing the policy work for him, the policy wonk. I'm a data policy wonk girl. 
and it wasn't happening, right? One of his priorities was to reduce welfare because that increases the health of the city. And he said, you got to go over to the agency and say, I don't want to leave City Hall. You know, I want to be a special assistant to the mayor. And he's like, I'll make you a deputy commissioner. Go over there and do it from there. So I went from managing like three people to managing 10,000 people. And I will tell you, that guy, Rudy Giuliani, he supported me. He helped me to learn how to be a manager, gave me all the tools. You know, one of my quotes from my company is align your mission, vision and goals. And he showed me how to line that up to do that. So, um, yeah, but 10,000 people, you know, it, it's 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 in some ways, you know, it's it's like managing five people. You give them good direction, you give them the tools and you let them go. And that doesn't change no matter how many people you're managing. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And um, our focus today is um, so this idea of an <laughs> annoyance and um, but um, really ourselves. And we talk about um, stop tripping over myself and mm -hmm. managing yourself. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah. So, you know, I um, I lived in New York City most of my life. I'm fast, I think fast. And, um, you know, when this whole public embarrassment happened, I had to really think about how I wanted to show up with my emotions. And I showed up really differently. I didn't want to be bad mouthing my old boss. I didn't want to be doing those things. And, you know, that's how we take the bait, right? When it's important to us, when we're hurt, when we don't feel that we were heard or, right, or you know, appreciated. And I had to really learn how to zip the lip. And for me, and I think a lot of people like me who are well-educated, have a specialty, you know, doctors who are helping people, saving lives, we believe we should say whatever we think. But that is not so. So I had to really learn how to show up differently in a way that people could hear me. And I call it managing annoying me because it's my own emotions and it's the way that my emotions show up. Yeah. Were you ever in a situation where, you know, everybody's discussing something and even if you're the boss, you say something and people are like whatever. And two minutes later, someone else says the exact same thing and everyone hears them. Do you know what I'm talking about? And says, great idea. And you're like, wait, that is the quintessential essence of managing annoying me. Why wasn't I heard? Why aren't I recognized? Why aren't I getting what I want? And it's all about like our backstory and how we heal that to move forward, to be of service and to help others achieve what they want. Mm. I love this idea of, um, cause I've been reading this book, um, it's talking about uh, managing emotions and it's talking about um, suppressing emotions versus um, constructive, like using your con your emotions constructively and, you know, bringing them out. And uh, you talk about this idea where um, feelings, not dealing with them can get in the way. What are the risks, you know, a suppression or you ignore it um, yeah. of not dealing with yourself? Right. So first of all, we know that feelings are information, right? And sometimes feelings are true, right? You know, remember the old phase, just because you think everyone's um, following you doesn't mean they're not, you know, if you're paranoid. But feelings come from our past experiences. So if you had something, I call them reminders or mirrors, you know, you had a mother or a father or a first grade teacher or someone that treated you in a certain way, and it was not a good experience. When that person shows up in the workplace or in a committee, or in your life, you're going to have the same reaction. You know, now you're a grown person with a degree and a checking account, right? And you're going to think, oh, I can manage them. But you are still coming to it with all of that childhood, you know, I call it hysterical, historical trauma and feelings. So there are those mirrors and those, um, you know, those reminders uh, about how we show up. And when you are annoyed, you know, people, and I'm sure there's a lot more information about this now, mental health, when you suppress, you know, it makes you sick physically, right? If you don't talk about your emotions, you physically get sick. But it also happens in your behaviors. You know, you say one thing, but you display another. Sure, I'll do that. Yes. You know, you 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 emotionally, when you're annoyed, right? There's a your doctor, there's a physiological response, right? First comes in the reptilian brain and you just flee or you, you know, freeze. I say it's complex. Some people flee, you know, first they fight, then they get, I call it freeze. They fight, they freeze. Some people just run. So that happens. But once that 
that mechanism starts, it gets to the decision making part, the amygdala in your brain, where you know problem solving is solutions. So you are not as sharp and really not in a position to be contributing once you're annoyed. Your entire perception is off. And that's really what managing annoying me is about, right? My perceptions of me and how other people see me. I don't know if I'm answering the question because I might have lost it in my little tirade, but one of pieces of advice I give to people is mind your own BS, blind spots, not bullshit, right? <laughs> because it's really about what others see and you don't. And, um, you know, I, 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 I've been, uh, you know, writing this new book and I'm telling the story about this woman who doesn't like her emails and she thinks she's being so gentle in the way she's writing back. So she'll write back something to her colleagues and then she turns and she starts cooking furiously. And she doesn't really understand that these emotions are also going into the emails. She's like, that'll hold them as she mixes the eggs. And then, you know, at the end of the day, a few emails, for, you know, that could have been okay. All of a sudden her inbox is like multiplied like a rabbit. And she's like, what, what's wrong with my colleagues? When it was her snarky responses and that energy that she was putting in it. Did that answer your question, Christopher? Or did I veer off? And then uh, one thing is uh, talking about, um, so you managing, you know, blind spots, taking self inventory, you talk about this idea, uh, you know, what are the steps to take? And um, can you provide a few simple steps that listeners can do right away? Hey, um, the first thing I do is call it Goldilocksing, right? We all remember the fairy tale, right? Goldilocks goes into the cabin. The This is too hot, too cold, right? She keeps, She can't find the right thing. So the first thing is to right size it. What's the right size for you? Another way of looking at that is this the hill you want to die in? Someone misquoted you. Someone said something you were going to say. Is this the issue that you should lose your mind over? Or should you wait till you're talking about your compensation or your salary or, you know, actually where your parking spot is? Something that might affect you on a day to day basis. So the first thing is to really right size what's going on. Take a breath. You know, that's the only thing we can do in that moment. We cannot open our mouth, right? Just take a breath instead of shooting and think about right sizing. But there's one other thing about Goldilocks we always forget. She was trespassing. That was not her house. It doesn't mean that matter that she found the right chair, the right bed, or the right porridge. It wasn't hers. So that's the second thing. Once you say, is this the hill I want to die on? Is this that important to me? Is it even yours to really worrying about? Or is it what we were talking about before? It's an old issue. It's a mirror. It's a reminder. It's something in your past that you're bringing to your present. So that's the first thing. Think about Goldilocks because she was trespassing and she should have been arrested. So are you in your, you know, dance space, as they say, or are you in someone else's? So that's a boundary. Think about your boundaries. The second thing I say to people is start stopping today. You know, everybody talks about letting go and being with the Zen and find a way to calm yourself. And we've all been there. And I have found only one thing works for me to acknowledge that it is never a good time to do something different, but you have to stop starting today. It's always the first step that's the hardest, right? So tomorrow I'll react to that different. Tomorrow I'll make that call. Next time I'm going to handle it. But right there in the moment, because you know, feelings are information. We just let them go right to our heads. In your gut, you know, you know, I, I want to react. I'm not going to react. Because especially in the workplace and in business situations, there's always another bite at the apple. There's always going to be another meeting where the same person does the same thing. Only you can change that that merry-go-round you're on yeah quite yeah I, lo I love this and you talk about boundaries and then um talk about managing our reactions for better outcomes in when we're dealing with ourselves other people and tell us about more about that yeah so what happens you know when we don't manage our outcomes or we don't better manage is you know, especially if we're the leader in the situation, we think rolling our eyes is okay or making a snarky <laughs> comment. But pretty soon you lose your team and your colleagues' trust. They might think it's funny at first. They might say, oh, this guy, this woman's got a sense of humor. But pretty soon they realize you can turn on them as quickly as you just turned on 
whoever it was. So the idea is that we want to grow our sphere of influence. We want to, under any and all conditions, be that person who is looked to as older and wiser, the voice of reason, that is the person who is critical to have in the room. And while we are worrying about our own behavior and looking crazy and feeling crazy, we are not being productive. We are not bringing our A game. And we are definitely not inspiring trust and you know around us. And then there's the after story. We go back to our office, our room, our car, and we start, do you believe this? What happened? Listen, and you replay it. So now you're in a time suck. So a big problem with not managing your emotions is not only the way that your colleagues see you, but then your pro productivity plummets because you afterwards have to replay it and be mad about it and think about it instead of when you show up and say, that wasn't mine. I don't like it as hard as it is. I'm going to leave that over there. But you know what? When you do that, the entire kind of ecosystem, you know, changes around you. The temperature of the room comes down. People are more collaborative. And you don't lose that time stock afterwards either. One thing is uh, with high achieving performance, uh, sometimes you don't feel like you belong. And there's this um, thing called imposter syndrome versus overconfidence. I know you have some thoughts about that to share with the audience. Yeah, you know, um, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and we discuss a lot like, who am I to have this idea? And there's that balance between, you know, nothing could go wrong, which now they call like positive optimism or something. There's a term for that, like nothing could go wrong or I'll never be good enough. And I always say to them, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you better get a new room because you are doomed to fail. So like, if you are sure, you know, if you think you're not smart enough, great. Listen to others, see what they have to say, aspire until you know, you know what they know, then find a new room. So there's always a way, you know, I joke, I'm holding up a little tiny ladder. Do you see it? <laughs> <laughs> you, say, you know, we're climbing up the ladder. If you think you're the smartest person in the room and you know what's going on and everybody else doesn't climb down a wrong rung. I literally use this with people I coach to say, where are you in the ladder? And often it's like the monkey bars. I'm holding it sideways now. We are just holding on. And if you want to get to the next step, you got to let go. So, you know, it's really about that concept of, um, you know, how, how, tight are you holding on and what do you want and how do you go from thinking i know it all or i don't because on a ladder you need balance you need trust and you need stability when the ladder shakes it's not the wall that's shaking it's you that's shaking so imposter syndrome is um you know it holds people back and it really once again like your feelings that are information imposter syndrome is a feeling i'm not good enough everyone else knows more you know, nowadays we have people who didn't go to college and, you know, have created incredible, con you know, there, there are so many examples of how people achieve and what success is. And that really goes into your own beliefs. So look at your beliefs, right? Do I believe I can be successful? If the answer is yes, then maybe I don't belong in this room, but boy, am I glad I'm there and use every opportunity you have. Mm, I love that. What a great way to end it. Um, how can people contact you, follow you, reach out to you? Uh... Yeah, uh, LinkedIn is the best place, Eileen Marcus. Um, if you type in managing annoying people, I will come <laughs> right up on Amazon for my book. And my new stuff, I'm really trying on, out on YouTube on ladderism or talkism. So you'll see a lot of my videos with these short little learning things of these concepts. Yeah. Um, so that's where you can find me. And uh, let's thank for this fantastic conversation. Uh, all of the resources will be in the links and show notes. And with that, thanks so much for coming onto the podcast. I hope you really enjoyed that wonderful, inspirational, motivational piece. Again, if you, wherever you are listening, if you liked it, be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. We're on everywhere, Spotify, iTunes, Google, Amazon, Audible. And without much ado, be sure to thank this show's sponsors, and we'll see you next week.